Hello, my name is Professor Murray Daw. I am a professor of physics at Clemson University, and I'm also on the faculty at the Institute for Advanced Physics. This is the first recording of a series of classroom lectures, except this first one does not involve the live students. This first lecture is just information for those of you who are listening to the recordings. This course is based on a textbook called, Phys called Physics for Realists. And I'm using the first volume uh, mechanics for these lectures. This is uh, the textbook that I use for our regular physics with calculus sequence. At Clemson University, these recordings are made in the fall of 2013. So this first lecture is simply for those who are listening to the recordings. There was a, a corresponding first day of lecture for the Clemson students. These are all freshmen, so this is their first uh, semester at college. And uh, so there were a lot of logistical things that we needed to cover. Uh, how to buy the textbook, how to find uh, uh, the, the online materials for the course at Blackboard, uh, for the restrooms, who their academic advisor is, and all that sort of stuff, just to make sure that they know those things. Uh, so uh, that lecture was not recorded. Uh, and instead, I decided to make this recording for you, uh, which was specifically for those who are going to be listening to the recordings at a later date. So these introductory remarks, for the most part, are, are uh, for those who are listening to the recordings. So as I said, this is a series of recorded classes. All of the classes will be recorded, except uh, one or two of them where I gave an in-class exam. Of course, I'm not going to record those. Uh, and these were taught, as I said, in the fall of 2013. The textbook is Physics for Realists by Dr. Anthony Rizzi. Volume 1 is, uh, comprises the first semester of the course. It's a two-semester sequence mechanics. Uh, the second semester does both electricity and magnetism and a little bit of thermodynamics. And that I will cover next spring, next semester. My plan at the present is not to record that yet, the second semester. So these recordings should comprise just the first semester, the first volume. Uh, my plan is to record the second semester at a later date. OK, so as I said, I'm a professor of physics at Clemson University, and I'm also on the faculty at the Institute for Advanced Physics. And the textbook author is the director of the Institute for Advanced Physics, uh, a professional physicist in his own right, Dr. Anthony Rizzi. So I use that textbook in class, and these recordings, except this one, will be of, of the live class. So there will be students present. I'm the only one in the room at the moment. Uh, but there will be students in this classroom. It's a smart classroom, so-called smart classroom, so these recordings can be made. There are approximately 20 students in the classroom, and the classroom is about the right size for 20. So it's a nice setting for it. And you even should be able to hear their questions uh, and, and, and their answers when I call on them, because there's a lot of interaction in this classroom. I encourage the students to be involved asking questions and to answering my questions uh, in the classroom. So hopefully you'll benefit by this live recording, because I think it will be useful for you to hear their questions. It'll be useful for you also to hear their answers to my questions and to the questions of other students, because sometimes when a student asks a question, I, I open it to the other, open it uh, to the class to answer the question or to see what kind of answers they're going to give that may need some correction. Anyway, I hope that this uh, live presentation will be helpful for you. And if you are a teacher, maybe uh, you will find this also helpful. So here's the textbook. It's a new freshman physics textbook. This is the first volume, the cover of the first volume. And as I said, there's a second volume, Electricity and Magnetism. Uh, this textbook is completely unique. There is no other textbook like this. Uh, we can get into that, and we will get into that as you read through the book. The book discusses the ways in which it is unique. Um, but just to give you a, a simple sentence, uh, a short summary of it, I will say that it presents physics by starting with the simple things that we all learn through our senses, that we see, hear, and feel. Uh, these books are the ones that I use in this course. So this is the foundational physics education for physics majors at Clemson. They have me for the first year with these textbooks. 
So the recording I'm making, these recordings, because I've gotten a lot of inquiries from students not at Clemson and also teachers uh, at Clemson and not at Clemson. And these recordings then are, are intended to allow people to study the textbook on their own, either because they're students wanting to learn physics this way, or maybe because they're teachers and they want to learn the textbook. Of course, the teachers will realize as soon as they start getting into this textbook, they have a lot to learn. There is something that they have to learn in order to be able to use this textbook. And the hope is that these lectures, these recordings, will help teachers as well in learning how to present this material uh, while they're, they're learning to digest it themselves. Hopefully, you'll have time to digest it before you start trying to teach it. But uh, if you uh, allow me to use my own, the benefit of my own experience, uh, I'm still learning a lot about this. Uh, this is a very uh, rich way, a very natural way of understanding physics. There are also some other materials that I'll make available to you uh, if you'll email me. My email address is there, daw at clemson.edu. Uh, I make uh, copies of the podium notes. So while the lecture is going on, I have a smart tablet over here that I'm writing on, and uh, that is being recorded. And also, uh, uh, I will take what's on the podium notes, and I'll convert that to a PDF. And the PDF is then sent out to all the students after class. Those will also be available to you. The advantage that you will have is that you'll have the podium notes. You could have the podium notes in front of you while you're watching the lecture, which makes it actually a little bit easier. The students don't have the podium notes, of course, until after the lecture is over. The other thing I can make available, other things I can make available include reading assignments for the, the students in my class take. Um, and uh, so, in other words, be prepared by having read this uh, before the next lecture. Also, uh, homework assignments and a few other handouts that I give. Uh, that most of the homework assignments are straight out of the textbook, but there are a few that I've uh, developed that are not exactly from the textbook, that are different from the textbook, and so I uh, will include those. Also, on the first day of class, I actually give a test. It's a prerequisite math quiz. This is not intended as guidance mostly for the students, especially uh, for the, these freshmen. As I said, they're coming into college and they're trying to find their, their, the level of their mathematical ability also. So I give them some feedback uh, in the form of this math quiz. I present on this math quiz stuff that I expect that they will know by way of algebra, simplifying expressions and solving uh, coupled equations for two or three variables and also some trigonometry that I expect that they should know, those sorts of things. So I can make that available to you as well, um, and, and you can uh, make use of that. These recordings, uh, as you will note, uh, combine two video streams. One is of me standing here either behind the podium, or my tendency is to walk out in front of the class and engage the students. So I'll pan the camera back. Uh, for most of the lectures, there would be a, a wider view of the classroom. Today, for the purposes of this introductory lecture, I focused it down to this. But So there's this one video stream, which is of me wandering around up here, maybe doing one or two demos, uh, which uh, don't come out really well in these videos, but they're very simple video uh, demos. I think you can get the idea of them. The other video stream is, as I said, what's going on on the computer screen here on the smart tablet. And so I'm writing here, uh, especially when we're getting through going over solutions, uh, diagramming things, writing down equations, and, and manipulating them. I'm writing here, and that's also being recorded. And in fact, that's what gets recorded down, uh, saved as a PDF when I'm done. So not only will you have the video of that, but you'll also have the PDF of what goes on on the uh, podium screen. Um, occasionally, the class gets started kind of slow, and uh, that's because uh, the recording actually begins a few minutes before class. So there are a few minutes where it seems like nothing is going on on the recording, and in fact, well, it's, we're just milling around. I'm waiting for students to, to take their seats, and uh, some of them are coming from another class somewhere, so wait for the right time to start. And even on the second day of class, we still had some logistical things to cover. I didn't get through all of them on the very first day. So, for example, on the second day of 
class, which is August 23rd, 2013. There were some more logistical things to cover, and so I was actually about 15 minutes into that recording, as you will see, before we really get down to the business of the textbook. Okay, so feel free to skip ahead. Uh, the, the, whatever format you're using, you're reviewing this in, you should be able to skip ahead, and in fact, that may be a good practice when you start a lecture. You might want to skip ahead a few minutes, and um, and then if you, once you get into the into the real business of the class, and you can move back a little bit if you need to, uh, to get to, back to the beginning of that. You don't want to spend a few minutes waiting for people to sit down and for us to get down to business. Okay, so now that's logistical stuff for those who are watching the um, recordings. On the first day, I, I didn't want to just handle logistics. I really did want to get students a feeling for what they were getting into in this class, in addition to the math quiz, which did help them get a feel for the level of the class and the, uh, uh, what was required of them as students. But I also wanted to give them a feeling for how this course is different, especially different than the high school physics texts, the high school physics courses that they had, most of them had. So, uh, I'm going to present now for the next uh, 10 minutes or so um, that brief flavoring that I give at, at the end of the first day for the students. Uh, the intention here is to give them an idea of where they're headed. So I begin by helping them to understand that we are made for truth, that the intellect, human intellect, is ordered to knowing the truth. That's really what science for us is coming to a knowledge of the truth. You could uh, make analogies. Some are better than other ones. One that's okay, not great, is a cheetah. A cheetah is built for speed, right? Everything about the cheetah is made for going fast. In some ways, that analogy applies to us, but maybe, maybe it's even more true for us. It's a stronger statement for us that we are ordered to truth our intellect is ordered to knowing the truth, and finding the truth, and that's really what science is about. Science from the Latin word scientia, meaning knowledge. So, to go along with that then, this course is about understanding. It's not about acquiring skill sets. It's not about uh, uh, collecting a bunch of factoids or individual formula. It's not about plug and chug. It's about understanding. And in that sense, this course is oriented more than other physics courses that I know of, much more so to what is ultimately human, that is the intellect. Uh, so for this reason, it's a very human course. Now, I'll give an example. Here's a, a question that has to do with this idea of understanding. What is momentum? Now, I asked this question, of course, for of a classroom full of students, most of whom, not all, but most of whom have had some high school physics. And 95% of the time, the answer that I will get is P equals MV. I'll get an equation coming back. Uh, and actually, that's the kind of answer I expect to get and do get most of the time. If I just ask a bunch of physicists, not just students, but professional physicists, the same question. What is momentum? I'll get almost all sums. P equals mv. Okay, so now that's an answer of a kind. It does express some kind of understanding, but it requires a lot of explanation. There's something back behind that that we understand when we talk about momentum. And so the question is, what is that? What is this momentum? Because P equals MV is not always true. So what is this momentum that we describe? Um, and also, secondarily, by way of understanding the first uh, question here, maybe we also do come to an understanding of what an equation is. What does an equation have to do with physics, and why do we use equations in physics? So there are two important aspects that are addressed by this question. So this question turns out to be very challenging, as I said. Once I take an equation off the table, I, don't, I want an explanation, but I don't want it in, in terms of an equation. And I, I justify that by saying, uh, by quoting 
uh, Richard Feynman here, if you really understand something, then you should be able to explain it in simple terms. I really take this uh, suggestion uh, by my teacher to heart. I really think he's right in this regard. And so if we're going to give an answer to this question about momentum, can we do it in, in a way that doesn't involve an equation? Can we do it in a way that involves simple terms? After all, we're talking about the stuff, ordinary stuff around us, right? Momentum is has something to do with the things around us. We all have an experience of momentum. And so that we should be able to tap that, but in a rigorous way, and build on that. And that's what we meant, that's what I meant when I said earlier that this textbook builds on our common understanding, our common experience of the physical world. Okay, so by way of, uh, of uh, introducing then the, this textbook, the students will learn then what momentum is and what it has to do with physics and equations. What do, physic, what do equations have to do with physics? Why, are, why do we use equations in physics and how is it that mathematics has anything at all to do with physics. Okay, now uh, by, by way of discussing this textbook, I wanted to point out to the students a few things about this textbook. It's very different, aside from the fact that it emphasizes understanding. It's also written in a way that's different than what they're used to. Most science students, uh, I think when they read a textbook, tend to skim, or at least they skim most of it. They may study only sections of it, small sections. Most of it they, they don't really study. Uh, also, they tend to pattern match. So when they're going through something, they might skip to the problems at the end of the chapter, and then they work their way back. When they, when they find a problem they don't know how to work, they work their way back to find an example that matches the question that the problem that they're trying to answer. Uh, they tend to collect little bits and pieces of information. Uh, rather than integrating it. And they tend also to be very specific about the things that they know. And, uh, and that's how they come to understand the material in some way. Uh, the, the students really aren't involved in this because this is the textbooks are written to encourage this approach. Uh, this textbook, Physics for Realists, instead is not like that. And you can't approach this textbook by skimming it or by matching patterns or by collecting bits and pieces or being specific. Instead, this textbook pushes students to study. It pushes the integration, it pushes the understanding, it, put, it helps them to understand and think in general terms as well as specific terms. So when you're studying this material, this textbook, I suggest first that you read the text once for general concepts. What's going on in this chapter? Uh, there is, what is the general flow of the chapter? Why did the author order the, the discussion the way he did in this chapter? And why is this chapter where it is in the textbook, too? Why does it come here and not somewhere else? Everything about this textbook has been thought out very carefully. There's nothing left to accident here. Second time you read the, question, read the uh, textbook, uh, you should have... Uh, beside you the reading questions that I provide for the first four or five chapters and after the first four or five chapters you should start making your own uh, written summary as you're reading the second time. And this gets you at a, into the text at a, at a more deep level, at a more specific level, you get into more details, uh, which then you have to of course relate back to the general understanding that you got from the first reading. Also at the end of every chapter is a summary, a great way again to try to begin the integration uh, or, or to continue the integration of the material, trying to figure out how it all fits together at the end of the chapter. And very important is working the problems, answering the questions that are assigned. That's the best way to study this material. Listening to these lectures, reading the textbook are only going to get you so far. It's once you start trying to struggle with the material by way of writing down answers. That's when things start to seep in and, 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 and you must learn to digest them in order to be able to, to uh, uh, answer those questions and work those problems. Uh, then I suggest after having done that you read it a third time. And that last time will really 
you will already, after you have it now grappled with the problems and the questions and you've already worked through the summary um, and you've digested it at a certain level, reading it again a third time will really help for you now to understand, oh, that's what he was getting at, right? That's why he said it that way. It's really going to be a very important thing to do, that last read. A lot of reading. There's a lot of reading in this uh, because the book is challenging that way. It's, challenge, it's a wordy book and it's done in such a way as to be very uh, helpful, uh, but it's written specifically in this way and I'll talk about this again in just a minute. Okay, so the general approach of this text is to work from general to specific. So he lays out the general principles of physics and then he works towards specific understanding how to how to uh, make these general principles, how to understand them in these specific situations. The general principles are probably not what you tell me, by the way, uh, which gets us into the subject of chapter one, but I don't want to get there too fast, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So, uh, the other thing about this book, as I said, is it's wordy, and that's in in intentional. It's deliberate, like everything else about this textbook. Words connect better to the abstractions that are that he's trying to encourage. He wants to encourage abstract thinking, but the abstract thinking is built upon concrete things in a human way. That's the way we learn. That's the way we know. We know the physical world around us through our senses, and then the mind forms abstractions about those things that it knows. And that, But that process, now having formed abstractions in the mind, it's easier to connect to abstractions through words than it is through figures and examples. Uh, words are verbal expressions of the concepts and the abstractions that we have. And so that uh, connection, that means of using words to connect to the, the abstractions that are present already in the, in the students' minds, having lived in this world, they've, they've already formed some abstractions. So this course is trying to make them aware of what those abstractions are and trying to refine them, trying to make them more uh, in conformity with reality. Also, when you read the textbook, uh, the wording really is very simple. Although when you're in the middle of a paragraph, sometimes you have to stop and think, now what was that he was trying to do? I've got to go back and read that part again. Uh, but the, even though the wording is very simple, the subject itself is very profound. Uh, and I think you will come to an understanding of that as you go through this reading through the textbook. You will come to an appreciation for how deep this is, this uh, textbook. It's very deep. And what goes along with that, the fact that he, these words connect to abstractions and that the subject is very profound, the author is very aware of these things and he chooses his words very carefully. So there will be some definitions that you will need to memorize. If you open the textbook up to the inside front cover, he's collected some of these definitions on the, uh, together in one place. Now they're scattered throughout the textbook, of course but they're summarized, put together in one place on the inside front cover. You should memorize those definitions. Now remember, a definition is not an, an arbitrary thing that we make up. A definition is an expression of our understanding of the thing. So uh, these definitions are have been worked on very carefully. Again, the wording is very careful. and You should memorize these word for word. Uh, now, memorization is not the end of learning. It's not the goal. But it is a tool, and it's a tool that you can use to help you to keep these things in mind and to allow your mind to chew on them over time, and especially as you're working on the problems. Now, what is the way momentum, right? <laughs> what is mass, and what is force? And you, and you, but you've got to memorize these things and use them carefully in your mind again. Remember, these wordings are very precise. Okay, another way in which this textbook is very different than any other textbook. Chapter one is very important. In fact, it's the most important chapter in the book. Most science textbooks, chapter one is a throwaway chapter. It's some um, half-baked history, sometimes wrong, some less than half-baked philosophical discussion, in fact, often even worse than wrong. Uh, maybe some stuff about units which is, well, very few people like to talk about units, right? So chapter one in most textbooks is something that people want to just get past. Let's just go on to chapter two. Uh, resist that temptation here. Uh, 
Now, it wouldn't be surprising if you have that temptation because you would share probably the temptation of everybody in my class because that's the way the textbooks are written, right? So they get used to doing things this way. So I have to really make a point of it in class, to, and that's why I'm making it with you. The first chapter is the most important chapter in the, in the book. Resist the temptation to skim it or to skip it. You must read chapter one. Uh, okay, so I make a big deal out of this. In fact, I kind of make too big of a deal, perhaps. You must study chapter one. And that's because I've had experience with these students. It's first place. It's their first encounter with this book, which requires them to read carefully. And so they're just learning how to do that, learning to force themselves to study the book, which maybe they're not used to doing. Uh, but also, it's as I said, it's the foundational material for the rest of the book. The rest of the book builds on chapter one. Without chapter one, you've got nothing to build on. And I have learned through experience, if I didn't go through this, emphasizing the necessity of studying chapter one carefully, some students wouldn't study it. <laughs> and so I have devised some techniques when I teach this to uh, focus the students' attention onto chapter one. We spend time going through it and really working it and talking about it and digesting it. So it's really important for you to study chapter one. And if you teach this class yourself, you must uh, really should learn how to emphasize this for your students. So here we go again, same message, got to study chapter one. Okay, so that's all for the first lesson. Uh, the next recording that you will see in the series are all listed uh, chronologically except this one that was made out of sequence. Uh, but anyway, this will be listed as the first recording for you to listen to. The next recording in the series is August 23rd. And all of the remainder of the, of the recordings for the rest of the semester are done in front of a live class. And uh, so I hope you enjoy that part. I know I really enjoy teaching this class. It's been a real joy, frankly, to use this textbook. And I really do enjoy the students who are in, the, in these classes. I get a real kick out of teaching them physics this way. I think it's just the best thing. Um, it's really good. All right. So I look forward to seeing you at the next lecture.